Hello, and welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas, and it's a pleasure to have your company. Tonight, Elizabeth is back to read the second installment of our exploration through beautiful Bordeaux in France. If you haven't heard the first episode, don't worry one bit. Tonight's tale can absolutely stand alone, and you can always go back and listen to Monday's story another time. Now then, get nice and comfortable in bed, and allow yourself to settle into the position that feels best for you right now. This is your time to let go of the day. Remind yourself that you've done all you can today, and you deserve to unwind, to relax and rest just as much as anyone else. So begin with a nice, deep breath in, feeling the rise of your chest and stomach. Then, softly release the breath as your muscles relax and your worries and cares begin to fall away. With each deep breath, you can imagine any disruptive thoughts or any tension you're holding rising to the surface along with the motion of your chest and stomach. And then, when the breath is released and the body sinks back down, those undesired thoughts or areas of tension fall through the mattress all the way down into the ground and into the earth where they are absorbed and removed from your body and mind. Bit by bit, breathe in and back out, and allow anything you'd like to let go of to be absorbed into the earth's core. The earth that gives us all life cares so deeply for each one of us, and it can assist you tonight in removing and relieving your stress, tension, or even any sense of responsibility. Just let it all sink down and fade away. When you're ready, you can let your breathing fall back into its natural rhythm as we make our way to a little street in central Bordeaux, ready to explore the historic surroundings. This is where tonight's story begins. A bell rings as you make your way along a brick-lined street. 
the sound of people setting coffee cups down on tables of a sidewalk cafe nearby provides an easy background noise. There are no cars along this narrow and picturesque street in central Bordeaux. But it is busy with walkers, a bicyclist or two, and of course the cafe goers. You can still hear their pleasant chatter underneath the echoing of the bell. You're on your way to meet your local guide, Jean-Marc, for your second day of discovering the wonders of this historic French city. It's no coincidence that a bell is ringing this time. It's precisely that bell that you're going to see, and it's where your rendezvous with your guide is set to take place. Called the Grosse Cloche, or the Big Bell. It's one of France's oldest belfries and among the city's most cherished monuments. You look up as the bell tower comes into view, framed at the end of the street between the attractive buildings that line either side. The tower looks similar to the beautiful medieval gatehouse that you saw earlier. Like the other, it reminds you of a tall and narrow fairy tale castle. A rectangle of solid looking stone is topped with several round towers and an impressive arched opening at the bottom turns it into a gateway. And a gateway is exactly what it was meant to be. You know that the Grosse Cloche was one of the entrances to the old walled city during the Middle Ages. The medieval period was a tumultuous time after all, and Bordeaux like many other towns, was surrounded by defensive walls. This gatehouse differs from the one you saw before in various details, however. The most significant is that an enormous bell hangs in an opening about two-thirds of the way up the building. It is this bell that sent vibrations through the neighborhood just now, marking its ceremonial monthly ringing. As it happens, it also marks the time of your meeting with Jean-Marc. He thoughtfully set your rendezvous at a time when you could hear the impressive sound from the protective distance of a couple of blocks. You approach the solid stone gateway and see him waiting in the shadow just outside the arch itself. Your guide's posture is at once relaxed and ready. He welcomes you warmly, his eager eyes sparkling at the appreciation on your face. You can see him light up in anticipation of sharing his passion with you, the history of his beloved city. After exchanging a few pleasantries, Jean-Marc launches into what he does best, spinning yarns. He's a master at weaving stories 
and historical details into a tapestry of human experience that comes to life in your mind's eye. To begin, he points out that a weather vane sits at the very top of the building. It's shaped like a lion, which was, he says, a symbol of the English monarchy. He explains that the gatehouse was built when Bordeaux belonged to the English crown. You have learned the history. The city was once part of an independent region called Aquitaine in the early Middle Ages. The area passed to English control when its duchess, Eleanor, married the heir to the English throne. It remained connected to England for three centuries, then finally became French after a generations-long conflict known as the Hundred Years' War. The gatehouse was a defensive structure, but Jean Marc tells you that people long ago sometimes jokingly referred to it as the Golden Lion Hotel because of the lion on the weather vane. It's with details like this that your guide, in his lilting way, so captivates your imagination. Even as he speaks, you can almost hear the raucous laughter of medieval guards echoing off the stone walls. Together, you pass into the cool shadows of the archway. An engraved plaque is set into its yellowish stones here. Your guide draws your attention to this plaque now. It gives a translation of a Latin inscription that is engraved on the giant bell itself. The inscription provides a fanciful account of the bell's multiple purposes. Jean-Marc gives his own translation of it, reciting softly, I call to arms, I announce the days, I give the hours, I chase away the storm, I ring the holidays, I proclaim the fire. And so it did. Centuries ago, the tower's bell was rung to alert the inhabitants of the city when they were under attack or at risk from dangers like fire. You and your guide continue through the archway to view the gross cloche from the other side. Stepping into the warming rays of the midday sun, you find yourself in a narrow stretch of a pedestrian street that ends in a wider, modern road beyond. There, a stream of cars flows over modern asphalt, carrying the residents of Bordeaux to their various destinations. Nowadays, Jean-Marc tells you the bell is rung for a handful of ceremonial occasions as well as at noon on the first Sunday of each month. Its powerful peal rings out on New Year's Day and four other important dates. Three of these dates relate to the First and Second World Wars, both of which took place on local soil and loom 
large in the recent history of this old land. The bell rings on the 11th of November, marking the end of World War I. It also rings on the 8th of May, in observance of the end of World War II in Europe. And on the 28th of August, the anniversary of the day Bordeaux was liberated after that conflict. And the bell rings as well on the 14th of July, often called Bastille Day in English, to commemorate the start of the French Revolution, which brought an end to the monarchy and heralded the eventual French Republic. The gentle rush of traffic from the modern street behind you penetrates your consciousness as you absorb these details. The warm sun is filling you with a contented, peaceful feeling, and your mind wanders pleasantly. You can almost feel Feel the movement of history in a place like this. The continuum of human experience is so real and ever-present here, where the ancient and modern coexist in such harmony. Low metal pillars separate the bit of car-free street where you stand from the busy road. You know from experience that these can be retracted if an authorized vehicle needs to pass. Here, on this pedestrian stretch, stone bricks form an alluringly old-fashioned pattern on the ground in place of asphalt. A woman near you is taking a photograph of a couple of children smiling in front of the bell tower. Two young people, students perhaps, stroll past. One of them is wheeling a blue bicycle slowly. They're in no rush. The student seems to draw your attention to a detail you hadn't noticed before. A dozen or more colorful bicycles are lined up neatly along one side of this pedestrian block. They stand in front of a store entrance, presumably a bike shop of some kind lending a charming, ordinary touch to this age-old place. The woman and children are done with their photo shoot now, and you hear the little ones chattering happily as they skip away. Beside you, Jean-Marc is speaking again. Like the gatehouse itself, the bell within it has a story too, he tells you. Or the bells, plural that is. Because over the years, many different ones have hung in this ancient monument. Some 500 years ago, Soon after Bordeaux became part of France, the French king took the bell from the tower to punish the city for a revolt. A few years later, it was returned to reward their improved behavior. The specific bell that the rather petty king took away is long gone, of course. But the current one is no spring chicken either. 
it was made in 1775, just before the United States of America declared its independence. But now, Jean-Marc is leading you away from this vestige of medieval Bordeaux towards a more modern site. You turn to face the asphalt-paved road with its stream of cars. It's wider than the narrow and winding streets of the oldest parts of town, and it's favored with wide sidewalks. This street embodies the bustle and flow of a very current city, but the signs of the past are still all around you. Graceful buildings of warm colored stone with wrought iron balustrades stand along the street. They look very much like the iconic buildings of Paris that form the popular image of French cities. Large, leafy old trees line the street, shading its sidewalks. You stroll in this pleasant shade now, simultaneously observing the passers-by and admiring the grand buildings. You're passing one now that has large, rectangular windows, partially covered with picturesque iron grates. The stone facade is decorated with ornate engraving. Two columns stand on either side of the building's enormous arched entrance. Within it are double doors of polished wood, carved in incredibly intricate designs. You pause, entranced by its beauty. Above this magnificent doorway, you see words engraved in the stone in elegant letters. Lycée Michel Montaigne. A high school. Your breath catches a little at the loveliness of this place of learning. Then you walk on, Jean-Marc guiding you towards your next destination. You don't hurry though. Both of you know that a big part of your experience is just walking these ageless streets watching, soaking it all in. You breathe gently, rhythmically, as the two of you fall into perfect step. Soon you reach St. Catherine Street, famous as Europe's longest pedestrian-only street. You turn into it and are swept away immediately by its tremendous charm. It's a lovely and busy shopping street, filled now with people. Some of them appear to be going about their errands. Others seem to be enjoying a leisurely stroll. All of them are clearly enjoying themselves. And you think, how could they not be? The allure of this beautiful street is as powerful as the pull of its appealing shops. The street is paved with glossy, beige, diamond-shaped tiles 
square grey tiles line the sides, forming an attractive contrast. Shoes clatter appealingly along this glossy pavement as voices mix and mingle around you. A young woman passes by, carrying a selection of shopping bags on one arm, a colourful bouquet of flowers clasped in the other. An old man approaches from the other direction. A long, thin baguette emerges from an interesting cloth bag that hangs on his shoulders. It's a bread bag, you realize. Couldn't possibly serve any other purpose because of its narrow shape. You continue down this charming street and soon another imposing archway is rising up ahead of you, marking the end of St. Catherine Street. This one is quite unlike the gross cloche where you began today's adventure. The interior of the arch is much higher and it isn't housed in a castle-like medieval structure. This is a triumphal arch built in the 18th century after the old medieval walls had been taken down. On the other side of the triumphal arch and framed by it, you can see a tall, skinny obelisk standing in a large plaza. This, your guide tells you, is the Place de la Victoire or Victory Square. You pass under the impressive arch and step into a huge cobblestone plaza with white stones forming diamond patterns that radiate out from the obelisk in its center. This fascinating sculpture is made of so-called red marble which in reality looks sun-faded and pinkish. Nearby, a metal statue of an enormous turtle faces away from the obelisk. The obelisk and the turtle are quite modern additions to the plaza. Jean-Marc tells you they're meant to honor the importance of the wine industry to Bordeaux. The turtle indicates the slow, steady rise of the industry, since the Romans brought choice vines here thousands of years ago. In days long gone, This big open area served as fairgrounds that stood just outside the walls of the city. Today, it's alive with people strolling about or lounging at the foot of the obelisk. A knot of young people are deep in conversation nearby and several bicyclists glide across the cobblestones. Jean-Marc proposes a break now, suggesting you might enjoy a beverage at a cafe to the side of the plaza. You agree readily. He leads you to a row of pretty chairs, lined up neatly, under large, red umbrellas. You sink into one of the comfortable chairs, made of woven vinyl. 
a waiter with an immaculate apron tied round his waist appears, and you order a month à l'eau. This refreshing drink is made with a sweet mint syrup mixed with cold mineral water. It's a favorite with you. You love it in part for its pleasant freshness, especially on a warm afternoon like this. But mostly you love it for its uniqueness. To you, it represents the south of France in a visceral way. It evokes this magical region immediately to all your senses. The waiter brings your drink in a tall, slender glass. The liquid inside is a bright, kelly green, and the glass looks almost frosted from condensation forming around the outside. An agreeable, minty smell meets your nostrils, and you breathe it in deeply. You take a sip, and the coolness greets your tongue. At the tables around you, many voices speaking assorted languages of the world mix and mingle in the afternoon air. You allow your eyes to close for a moment as you listen. The various voices and languages seem to blend and meld together into a combined human tongue which you fancy you can almost understand. There's a flow of French from multiple directions, of course, and nearby, you hear a string of what sounds like Italian. You catch the name Bordeaux, said almost reverently. A bit farther off, you hear a snatch of English, as someone admires the great plaza before you. In another direction, you hear the lilting notes of a Scandinavian tongue. Through all these voices runs an enthusiasm, a hope, an admiration, and a reverence for the beauty of human endeavor that surrounds you all. And it is this undercurrent this shared energy that forms the combined expression you imagine you can comprehend. You can feel its meaning and emotions deep within you. It reflects the human experience shared amongst all these people from all across the world and shared amongst all those people who came before, whose stories linger in this place. You breathe in slowly, recognizing your connection to all of them with a deep knowing that fills your being. You feel at one with the world around you and the sweep of time. And then you breathe out again, utterly at peace in this place, this time, and this story of Bordeaux.